Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and um, we're going to carry on today. Oops, sorry. Uh, with our discussion about fingerprints and fingerprinting. Um, we've learned something about the fingerprints themselves and about how they classified, analyzed, et cetera, et cetera. Let's um, talk a little bit today about how fingerprints are dealt with at the scene, how they are found, how they are processed, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you'll be aware that it's very, very easy to leave a fingerprint behind. Um, uh, the ridges on our fingers uh, sweat continuously, uh, leaving perspirations and the associated salts, oils along the edges of the, the ridges, and those are easily transferred to surfaces. But it may be very difficult to see that a fingerprint has been left. Um, it's quite difficult to visualize, and um, the fingerprint experts visiting the scene of a crime are trained to search out places, objects, etc., that might have useful fingerprints on them. And um, the, very often, most of the time, in fact, fingerprints are practically invisible to the naked eye, and they are referred to as being latent prints, not yet easily visible. But that uh, word latent, it's, it's misused a little bit because people often refer to fingerprints as being latent if they have not been processed and put into a state where they can be examined in the crime lab or where, wherever. But properly a latent print is one which is difficult to see with the naked eye. That's the proper definition. Um, there are some prints which are indeed visible to the naked eye. And um, these are referred to as being visible or of patent prints, uh, as opposed to latent prints, which are difficult. Um, and these are made, uh, you could think of them in a way of, as being positive imprints, because they are made after the finger has been in contact with some fluid usually, um, or it can be grease or dust even, um, and the finger, the, the, the surface of the finger is covered with a thin film, which is transferred then to a surface. The most obvious one of all would be that a, a fingerprint made in blood, where uh, a violent crime has been committed and the hands have been in contact with blood, and then it is trans and then have that blood transferred in the pattern of the fingerprint to another surface. Um, so that is, those are, those are visible or patent prints. There is another uh, type of print, uh, which is occasionally left, and that is where a, a mm. fingerprint is impressed into a soft material. Um, and one of the places where we might look for that would be, for example, at, at a window uh, that has been recently replaced and has been put freshly puttied. Um, but these prints have also been found in wax, in soap, when somebody has gone to wash themselves, wash their hands or whatever after commission of a crime. Um, and they can also be left in a film of dust, where if the, there's a thick field film of dust and you put the, the hand on it, the, the fingerprint actually lifts off dust and leaves behind an impression of the fingerprint. And there I have been there as I know of at least one case um, where somebody was chewing chewing gum, took it out of their mouth and threw it aside and left a positive print, a plastic print in the chewing gum. So any plastic substance like that can pick up a very good reproduction of the fingerprint as shown here in, in this example here. But um, detection of, uh, of fingerprints on other surfaces um, can be difficult. And the very first thing that has to happen is of course that that fingerprint has got to be found. It has got to be have an initial visualization by somebody looking for it. And um, so the, I, by the way, throughout this, I have um, given you uh, ref, further references, which I'm not going to hit the, the, the hyperlink now, but please come back to this and have a look here. Read this. This is a document 
um, describing a case solved by how a case is solved by latent fingerprint. So um, the surface onto which a fingerprint is deposited is very important. The easiest fingerprints to deal with are those which are deposited on non-porous surfaces. Fingerprints can be deposited on virtually any surface, but those deposited onto non-porous surfaces, table, glass, the floor, what, tiling, etc., those are somewhat easier to visualize and process than those which are on porous surfaces. So, um, the, to actually visualize them, very often they, the person searching for the fingerprint might try, for example, to look at the surface from the side so that they are visualizing fingerprints lit by side lighting, which picks up the ridges and it makes them more visible, but then provide their own source of lighting, a very strong flashlight, for example. Um, or another strong lighting source, like this one here, which has a flexible cable leading to, to the light source. Um, they, they may also make use of alternative wavelengths of light, for example, to use uh, ultraviolet light or blue, very bright blue light. And um, by doing so, you can shine from the side and have the, the fingerprint fluoresce slightly, and that makes it more visible once. Once it has been visualized like that and its location determined, then the fingerprint needs to be treated in such a way that a permanent record can be kept of the fingerprint. So the way in which this is usually done, the commonest and old, most old fashioned way still used is to dust the fingerprint with a powder. This can usually only be done on a non-porous surface. If you try this on a porous surface and the whole surface picks up the powder um, and that's not gonna help you. Um, but on a non-porous surface, carefully dusted with a very, very fine powder, the powder will stick just to the, the oils and the salts left behind on the ridge patterns of the fingerprint. And um, it produces this very, very vivid impression of the fingerprint. Now, the different things can be used um, on many surfaces, light surfaces. A black powder is used. It's carbon, and actually, it's just like toner, like black toner from uh, a photocopier. Um, but on a dark surface, there are other powders that can be used, for example, aluminium. Uh, sorry, aluminum powder um, can be used to provide a white or light gray coloration on a dark background, like a black surface. And they use a very soft brush because you don't want to damp, when this is dusted, you don't want to damage this ridge pattern at all. So a very, very soft brush with a very light touch is used to gently dust the Finger, uh, the place where the fingerprints are with this dust and the fingerprint picks up the dust in this impression like this. Mm -hmm. um, on non -por on sorry, on porous surfaces, um, this is a little bit more difficult, but there are very well established methods for visualizing fingerprints on such a surface. And if, for example, um, that the oils and everything that lay down the, the pattern of the fingerprint, those may also contain very small amounts of proteins, for example. And you can process that fingerprint for the proteins present. For example, this fingerprint here has been treated with a substance called ninhydrin. And ninhydrin is specific for proteins. No matter, their the, the concentration may be very, very, very low. It doesn't matter. The ninhydrin will still produce this vivid uh, pink purple coloration. And um, there, are other, there are other methods that also can be used. The, um, 
of, for example, this is frequently done with paper. The paper does actually record fingerprints very well, but they need to be specially processed. And sometimes uh, some other chemical methods may be used. For example, they may, um, uh, they may put it into a, a vessel um, and vaporize silver nitrite, silver nitrate rather, which uh, then sticks also to the proteins mainly in the fingerprint, and it comes up as a dark coloration like this. And you can also treat with iodine as well um, to get the, uh, to visualize the fingerprint. So there are various chemical methods that can also be used. Dusting on a on a non-porous surface, um, but chemical methods like this are specifically used on porous surfaces, especially paper, which is a common source of fingerprint. Now, on uh, there is one other method which is really important for non-porous surfaces, and that is to use superglue. This is the same superglue that you buy at CVS Pharmacy to do your repair, whatever. Um, and uh, superglue is a substance called, it's a cyanoacrylate, cyanoacrylate ester. And um, it can actually be vaporized quite easily. If you take um, the liquid superglue and you heat it up, it produces a vapor. And that vapor will preferentially settle on uh, materials like the oils and everything left in a fingerprint. And it is a very, very good way of visualizing fingerprints. Um, what, it, what it does is it actually makes, uh, it sets as a permanent kind of plastic at, along those ridge lines that make up the fingerprint. And um, you can uh, it f take an object that might have a fingerprint on it and put it into a vessel and vaporize an acrylate in that vessel and have the fingerprint developed. But you can also do it by using what's called a cyanoacrylate wand. And this is simply a, a gun, a heating gun that vaporizes the cyanoacrylate and you can direct cyan the fumes over an object in order to visualize the fingerprints. And this is what they look like. Um, the, the super glue has set all along the ridges and it's set as a permanent plastic mold almost, if you want to think of it like that, of the fingerprint. And these uh, very easily, this is very robust, they're, they're, this forms a very robust impression of the fingerprint. This can be dusted with fingerprint dust and then an impression uh, lifted from it, or it can be lifted directly. The lifting I'll describe in a minute. This is a way in which we keep a record of the fingerprint to take to the lab for analysis. So this is a cyanoacrylate visualization. Um, uh, this, the one thing place for non poor um, non uh, sorry porous surface that is really important um, is actually skin and um, fingerprints can in fact be left on skin and they can be visualized here actually are, uh, this is a patent print this is in blood on somebody's skin but there may be latent prints left on skin they are very difficult to deal with because you have to realize, of course, you can't dust easily, right? Because you're just going to dust the, the victim's skin uh, along with the fingerprint. But they can, in fact, be visualized by various means. And uh, included in today's class, there is um, a, a movie for you about a case which was solved by a fingerprint lifted from skin and detailing the kind of analysis that needs to be done in order to analyze such a fingerprint. But they can indeed be lifted from skin and uh, can be processed successfully. So 
once a print has been located, once it's been visualized by one method or another, then a permanent record has to be taken of that print in order for it to be processed properly and subjected to analysis and, of course, to comparison. Um, we the prints lifted from a scene of a crime are suspect prints. They are absolutely valueless unless they can be linked to a particular person. And that is usually done by taking that print and comparing it to a reference set of prints in some way. In the old days, that meant going through a gazillion fingerprint cards to try and find a matching print. Nowadays, we have it much easier. We can do it by computer, as you'll hear. Either way, in order for the processing to be done, that a record has to be taken of that fingerprint, and it has to be transported to the place where it's going to be analyzed. Now, um, wherever possible, uh, high quality photographs are taken of visualized prints before anything is done to them, before they are lifted or anything else. That is not only provides us with a record of the fingerprint, but it shows the exact place where the fingerprint was recovered from. It enables us, even after the fingerprint has been removed and lifted, taken away, it enables us to link it to a posi particular position in the crime scene. In some cases, fingerprints may be left on objects which can be carefully preserved and removed for analysis elsewhere. A gun, for example, a knife, something like that. Or and in this case, a bullet casing, which, which carries a, a fingerprint on it. In many cases, um, uh, investigators will choose to visualize the print and take the print records and everything there at the scene of the crime, rather than bagging the ob a small object and running the risk of damaging prints which are present on the object. So the processing may be done there at the scene of a crime if in order to make sure that the, the, the print is taken as fresh and pristine as, as possible. Um, the photographs of fingerprints on objects like that is of particular importance in, and, um, because these fingerprints are subject to damage during transport. Now to preserve a print, there are various methods that can be used, but here is uh, one of the simplest and one of the most effective. And that is to lift the print um, with a clear adhesive tape. So if we have a, a fingerprint that has been dusted with a dark powder, for example, a section of tape is cut and pressed to that print and is then pulled off and it takes, a, uh, it takes the dust away with it and gives you the impression of the fingerprint. And, um, in the case of, a, of a, a dusted print, that is that usually destroys the original print that's on the surface. You can't go back to it and, and redo it. In the case of a fingerprint which is isolated with cyanoacrylate, the cyanoacrylate forms a plastic, hard impression of the fingerprint, and it can multiple impressions can be taken. You can take them directly from the cyanoacrylate. It still leaves a sufficient mark on the tape for that to be photographable and analyzable. Um, but the cyanoacrylate can be repeatedly dusted and a print taken like this from a cyanoacrylate. That's one of the big advantages of a cyanoacrylate print. Um, you see that, the, that this tape this, uh, they, they're using a special uh, adhesive tape, which is basically exactly the same as packing tape or cellar tape or anything like that, excepting it's absolutely clear. But here it has a scale on it, uh, which enables us to measure the print carefully. Um, these uh, original prints can now be, can also be 
of course, be photographed in the lab and the photographs used for analysis. Um, the, those uh, listed prints um, can also be digitally imaged. Um, they can be subjected to digital an analysis. And in digital imaging, the picture is converted to a whole uh, digital computer file, which is an in in incredibly useful technique because it il allows us now to take our suspect fingerprint and compare it to increasingly enormous databases of other fingerprints in the hope of a, of a match. Um, in addition, a, a digital analysis, an imperfect print, a partial print, a print which is, which is rather poor to the, to the naked eye, can actually be enhanced. It can be digitally enhanced. Uh, this has to be done extremely carefully because you, you run the risk of introducing uh, information which wasn't originally there. But it's an extremely useful technique. And it's at the end of uh, this class, you view the movies, you'll hear in the movie about the fingerprint lifted from skin, how digital imaging was used to subtract the victims skin print from the actual fingerprint of the perpetrator. And that was digitally done to enhance the, the suspect fingerprint. Now, there, there's another aspect to the digital printing, which is incredibly useful. And that is when comparing the suspect print to a reference print, and somebody doing the analysis can highlight minutiae on the, on the suspect print that strike them as being important. And the digital analysis will search for those same features on the reference print. And it will give a hit for everyone that is found. And this means that the, the analyzer is not continually having to compare by eye back and forth and back and forth. They're simply working with the suspect print, striking on things which they seem to them to be important minutiae, and digitally they are searched for on the reference print. This en enables a very rapid series of, of comparisons to be made. Um, remembering that in digital analysis like this, in the end, we are still going to take a certain set of reference prints and our suspect print, and we're going to ask a, an, anal an analyst to do the comparison by eye, despite the fact that we've gained an enormous amount of information already digitally. At the end, it is still needs the human eye to determine that a match has been made so that a human being can go into the courtroom stand and be questioned about th that analysis. Um, a computer can't be taken and cross-examined uh, in a court of law. So um, most of you, I would think by this stage, probably at one stage or another, have um, had your fingerprints taken. Uh, we often do it just for, for identification purposes, for identification cards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the, the old fashioned way of taking fingerprints was is to roll ink um, onto the, the fingers and then pu put the fingers directly onto paper. So a direct print is taken. Normally when they will do, when they're taking your fingerprints, they will take your finger, they roll it onto the ink pad and then roll it onto the paper to take the fingerprint impression. It's messy. Um, mistakes can be made, can be smudged, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the hands of a, of a good person, it's, uh, it, it's relatively easily done. But nowadays, instead, we do it all electronically um, on, by putting the fingers onto a glass pattern like this. And the image is digital image. And um, that has huge advantages. First of all, it's not messy. 
it's extremely rapid, it's very accurate, and the information can be immediately sent into a database for comparison. So this is electronic scanning, and by far the majority um, of fingerprinting is now done by electronic scanning. So uh, here are uh, side by side comparisons. Um, this, this here is a latent print um, and it's been lifted from a crime scene. You can see there's actually two of them. This, it's typical, typically for a latent print, it might not be ideal, might not be a perfect print, but nonetheless, it has very clear minutiae, which you can see. Here's the, here's the sample print. This is the, the latent that was recovered from the crime, crime scene. This was from a suspect, and this is a, a print taken under ideal conditions, so it's a good, clear print. The analyst is going to go through and is going to say, here, what do we have here? We have the delta, um, here a bifurcation, here a bifurcation, here a bifurcation, here's a ridge ending there, here's a bifurcation there, with a ridge ending enclosed in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to go through and it's going to highlight each of these. The computer, meanwhile, has got the suspect print and is going to search and see, it, is there a match? Are there matches that are occurring here for each of the minutiae, which the analyst has? And after a certain number of ma positive matches have been made, the analyst may accept, yes, this is a likely match. There may be other prints where some matching does occur as well. A, a, a range of print sets may be submitted to the analyst in the end and a final analysis actually done by I so that that person can go stand in court of law and say, I matched these, 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 these minutiae. So the huge advantage of all of these digital systems is that it's very easy to acquire um, large data sets for reference. And um, these, uh, these digitized automated data sets are referred to as ACES sets, automated fingerprint information systems. So, and um, these, we have had automated fingerprint information systems since probably the late 1980s. So by this stage, um, most have accumulated a very, very large number of fingerprint sets, which are, but because they're digital, because it's electronic, they are very, very easy to sort through. And the sorting is done extremely rapidly once you submit um, a question fingerprint to the database. Um, so that seems clear. The problem is with, with these ACES sets, is that they are managed by different jurisdictions. So for example, um, different counties may have their own ACES set. Different jurisdictions may have their own ACES set. Certainly different states have their own ACES sets. And those ACES sets do not necessarily talk to one another very easily. They unfortunately um, use different algorithms. Um, they use different operating systems sometimes. Um, and so it becomes a little bit difficult sometimes for one jurisdiction to talk to another and they end up rather submitting to their own localized data sets with a restricted reach into other jurisdictions, which is a huge problem. And um, in, order to, in order to get around such a problem, the uh, uh, FBI has begun to set up a, their own uh, data set, which is supposed to be moving towards integrating the data, all the information from all of these regionalized APHIS or, uh, systems. And um, that, is regard, uh, that is referred to, the FBI system is referred to as IAFIS, the Integrated Automatic Fingerprint Identification System, which has operated since 1999. 
um, and uh, it has more, it says, it says here 80 million, but it's probably more than that by now. Uh, fingerprint sets, which uh, serve as the reference database. And those are mostly drawn from um, crimes, from uh, crime suspects who have had their fingerprinting done um, and in the course of investigation. Um, but it may, the IAFIS set may also include other things. For example, um, during citizenship application, uh, these sorts of procedures, fingerprint sets um, are acquired, and those may also form part of IAFIS. There is a problem with that gathering that kind of data, and um, that is that it, it begins to venture into Fourth Amendment territory of acquiring information without the full knowledge of the person donating it. So then people may not be aware, for example, that fingerprint sets are going to be stored by the FBI. So that it has come under some legal challenge. Nonetheless, IAFIS is tremendously useful because it at least is moving towards integrating the information from uh, things like the state AFIS systems. In addition, um, IAFIS has uh, a set um, way of requiring information input. So in order to get uh, something examined by IAFIS, it has to go in in a certain format. Now that is, that is obviously so that it works efficiently, but it provides and the way for different states or different jurisdictions who have different AFIS systems to communicate with one another. Because if they put it into the FBI format, then they can talk to one another. Their systems can talk to one another. So it has that advantage as well. In recent times, that IAFIS system has begun to be upgraded since the 2010s or so. They have been upgrading the IAFIS system, uh, not only to bring in new operating systems, et cetera, et cetera, or computer advances, but also to integrate the fingerprinting with other identification systems. So for example, it seeks to link uh, fingerprinting identification with facial recognition software, um, with iris scanning, which is another identification mechanism, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, uh, this new next generation identification system is an integrated system which draws information from various sources. Ultimately, it will probably link to DNA DNA identification databases, uh, which we'll hear about much later on. Okay, so well, that's it for that's all the talking I'm going to do for today because I want you please um, to do a little bit of work on your own. The first um, is to, is to uh, read document, but then uh, watch these uh, movies here, please. Um, I have not provided you with worksheets, that's not necessary. Take notes if, uh, if you can, um, but basically I just want you to see a couple of the cases uh, where different fingerprinting techniques have been used and where they have been particularly significant. Okay, and I'll see you then on Monday.